Greetings, everybody. This is Pastor Tim bringing you God's Word here on the Native Christians uh, video sermon for this week. We're starting a new sermon series that'll last just the next three weeks, Trick or Treat, kind of playing off of Halloween that was just this last Monday, taking a look at the devil's tricks, uh, the, the treats that he promises us and the real treats that God gives us through Jesus and the gospel. Uh, today we take a look at Genesis chapter 3. So I'll read for you verses 1 through 19. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, labor you, will bring, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food, until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. This is the word of God. I was tired. It had been a long summer. It had been a long couple of years. In fact, the previous year, the church where my father was a pastor had closed. So he had had no job. A number of months before that, my mom had been laid off from her job. 
So for a while, both of them were out of work. They had to move into a home owned by my uncles out in the countryside. They were working in some nearby factories, trying to make ends meet. I was spending the summer living in the city. I was working for a small painting company, spending most of my paycheck on rent and groceries. I had a weekend off, so I drove across the state about four hours to spend the weekend with family. I was tired from the long drive, tired from a week's worth of work, tired from the tough summer that we were all having. But just a few weeks ago, I had asked my now wife to marry me. She had spent a week close by. Her parents lived close to where I was working that summer. But she and I were living in different states, spending the summer working, making some money, trying to save up a little bit for the next summer's wedding. So imagine my surprise when I walked in the door and there is my fiance. I had no idea that she was coming. We got to spend a couple of days together with my family to celebrate, spend some time together before each of us had to go back to work. It was a nice surprise. The surprise in Genesis chapter three is not so nice. Verse one begins, now the serpent. That now at the beginning of the chapter is meant to show us that this is a surprise. It's unexpected, an intrusion on God's good creation, an invasion of an enemy, an unwelcome surprise. Not like seeing your fiance when you're not expecting her, a surprise like an ambush, like a terrorist attack, unexpected, taking you off guard, filling you with dread. Go back and read that chapter. You can pause the video, go back and read that chapter and listen to those words. Chew on them, roll over them in your mind, feel the weight of the terrible loss that this sudden surprise brought. Serpents are predators, cunning hunters made to kill. Depending on what kind of snake you run into, it has a couple of different ways to deal with its prey. Maybe it has venomous fangs. It can bite onto something and inject a poison into the body of its victim. A boa constrictor is a rope of thick muscle made to wrap itself around its prey and crush the life out of them. Or maybe your run-of-the-mill snake that I used to see in the chicken coop, sneaking into the nest to swallow whole the eggs lying there by its cunning and stealth. By cunning or might or poison, a serpent is a killer. And this serpent in Genesis chapter three comes to kill. His poison is not injected into the bodies of his victims. His poison is injected into the mind. His poison is doubt. His cunning is not in stealthily sneaking into the nest to gobble up eggs, but to tell lies and half-truths, to sneak by their defenses. His great strength is not in his body, but in the cords of death that he wraps around Adam and Eve. Did God really say? Comes the sharp bite of doubt. The serpent wants Eve to doubt God's goodness, to believe that God is withholding something good from her that the world would be better if they disobeyed God. He wants to infect her mind, to see that uncertainty spread throughout her whole being as she weakens and gives in to his temptation like a poisoned victim. 
he goes on, you will not certainly die. You will become like God. An outright lie mixed in with half-truths. Yes, they would know good and evil, but their knowledge would make them less like God than they already were. They were made in the image of God. They were made to live forever. But as soon as they took a bite, they would lose that image because they believed the lie and broke God's command. And so they certainly would die, just as God promised, just as God said, because everything that God says must come true. They are crushed. The life is squeezed out of them by the chains of death, dragging them to the grave. This serpent, the devil, he leads the whole world astray, and in so doing, he brings death into the world. Jesus would later say that he was a murderer from the beginning, a snake wrapping up his victims and poisoning their minds, cunningly destroying all that was good. But that doesn't mean that we get off free. Yes, we are victims of the devil's schemes and temptations. He is a crafty liar and he is cunning and mighty. But sometimes we like to drink the poison Sometimes we crawl into the dreadful coil of his lies. We are murderers too. It was a surprise for Eve, now the serpent. But it's a surprise for us to see her fall into temptation. But maybe it shouldn't surprise us. The devil had to work a lot harder on Eve than he ever has to work on us. She had the devil in her face in bodily form, convincing her to disobey God. You and I, he doesn't need to pull out the big guns on us. All it takes is just a little whisper, a glance as we walk along on, at what she's wearing, and we're falling headlong into the devil's trap of lust. Just one look from that person, and you know what they're thinking. You know the one, the one who doesn't like you, the one who never seems to think or say or do anything kind to you. You hate them for it. Just one day gone wrong and you're believing the lie. That one lie that's at the core of all the temptations that the devil slings at us. Did God really say the doubt? The doubt that really at the core of it is asking, is God really good? That's what the devil wants us to think. That with the world the way that it is and the life that I am living and the things that happen, God cannot possibly be good. Because if he were, I would have that thing I want. I would be married to that person. I wouldn't have to struggle. People wouldn't lose their job. The money wouldn't run out before the bills ran out. My loved one wouldn't have to die if God were good. If God were good, then no doubt my life would be good, and my life is not good. But why isn't it? Because when Adam and Eve ate from the tree, God came to them. He came to them in the garden, in the cool of the day, and he called out to them, and when their attempts to hide and to shift the blame and to escape what they knew was coming, when all of that failed, God told them the consequences of their actions. And no word of God fails to come true. I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you. You must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you are taken. For dust you are and to dust you will return. Why is my life not good? Because my father Abraham, my father Adam and my mother Eve sinned. Yes, but I'm not just a victim of their failure. 
This whole world is fallen, and I am fallen too. I have eaten of what I should not eat. I have gazed upon that which my eyes should not see. I have taken what is not mine. I have hurt. I have sinned. And I, I will return to the ground. For dust I am. And to dust I will return. It should not surprise us that our lives are not always good. We are sinners, descended from sinners, living in a sinful world, and sinners die. Sinners deserve to die. No surprise there. But as surprising as the devil's entrance into this story is, God has a bigger surprise in store. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. Adam and Eve deserve to die with the serpent, to be crushed under the wrath of God's punishment. And their bodies did return to the dust. But the serpent does not win. The poison does not kill them. His coils do not wrap around them. He does not get to devour them. The surprise of surprises is that God comes into the story. It could have ended with them eating and dropping dead. Just like that. But that's not the plan. God comes into the garden to speak with his fallen children. God lifts them up out of the dust. God tears off the mighty cords of death and speaks truth against the tempter's lies. In all the badness, all the wickedness, all the sin, God is good. God is so good that he would come in the flesh to be the one to crush the serpent's head. God is so good that he would be wounded by that old murderer and take the blows that we deserve. God is so good that he would be flesh and blood and die upon a cross, though he has none of the poison of sin to kill him. Though he is stronger than the cords of death, yet he lays down his life. Though he is eternal God who made the dust and formed it into a man, he lays down in the dust, is buried, the depths of the earth. And while we're listing surprises, on the third day, he rises again, shakes off the sleep of death, comes up out of the dust, proves that he is stronger than the death that the serpent brought into the world, shows that he can pry us out of the deadly coils and the venomous jaws just as surely as he has drawn the venom from our wounds. He can give life though we deserve death. And he does give life after death, though we return to the ground and our flesh turns to dust. Yet Jesus puts us back together. And it will happen. When Jesus comes in glory, Jesus has promised that he will return one day, will call all of his people out of their graves to live in glory forever. And that will be a surprise to many, to many who are convinced that there is no God, or if there is, that he cannot possibly be good. And so his coming is not good news. But you know better. You've heard God's promises. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes, he will be ready. We will be ready. We will not be taken by surprise. Yes, God is full of surprises. His surprising grace to grant eternal life to sinners who deserve death. His surprising entrance into a sinful world to set it free from the devil's trap and lies. But it's only surprising if you haven't been paying attention. God made this world. God loves this world. God takes delight in this world and wants this world to delight in him and live. And there is only one way for God to provide that light, that life, that grace by coming into this world, living and dying and rising again, by keeping his promise to send one who would crush the serpent's head. 
So just as surely as God said Adam would die, just as surely as God said Jesus would come into the world, God also says that Jesus is coming again. And every word of God must come true. So it should not surprise us when Jesus comes again, because God has promised that he wants to return and give us eternal life with him. And you can always trust God to keep his promise. Amen.